is this how much time? Is this like, because I don't stand in between us and lunch. It yeah. says 26 minutes. We, we, can, we, can, we can do 20. OK. okay. We, can go, we, can go, we can do it faster. All right, so for those of you, um, I guess, who weren't here yesterday, I was introduced then. But very quickly, I, um, I work with large companies and executives. I try to help them understand the world's mega trends. Um, and OK, my time is, OK, 20. Good, all right. The time just rolled down. It looked like, when it, it looked like the end of Mission Impossible. It was just going <laughs> I was like, um, great movie, by the way. Uh, and uh, you know, my job in the world is partly storytelling, but a lot of research and a lot of direct hands-on consulting and, and work and a lot of writing, trying to get the story out there that this is good for business, all the things you're hearing. Um, but um, we, uh, you know, there's kind of, over the years, as I've watched this space, there's um, rising pressure from most stakeholders that you could name on business, from consumers, from cu business customers, from employees, certainly. There's been one um, category of stakeholder that's really lagged uh, for a very long time, um, and that's the financial community. So um, we have uh, with us a, a really interesting perspective. So what we're going to do is talk, to build on what you've just heard, we're going to talk about the really very important conversation that happens between investors and the world's largest you know, public companies. Um, ideally, you want large public companies to be uh, driving capital towards the more sustainable ways of doing business, sustainable investments, but they're under unbelievable short-term pressure. Um, and and, and I, there's an incredible gap there. So we have um, with, from um, a little-known uh, regional five and dime in uh, Arkansas, Walmart, as, as Catherine uh, joked earlier, the uh, Fortune One um, Walmart. This is Catherine Neby, who's... Um, uh, ESG, you have a really long title. I have a actually. ridiculous title. So it, you're, yeah. you're involved in, in good stuff. Yeah. Um, if I re, let me see if I've got the title's on the screen, so it's good. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. good. It's um, uh, yeah, we got up there. And then Lila Preston from Generation. Um, I'm going to ask her in a second to explain what they do and and kind of why they're different than than what we've seen kind of from most investment houses. But let me just again, as I kind of did yesterday, give a little bit of context. So again, I've seen um, this very clear pressure rising on companies and, and, the, and the focus of, of business on doing things in a, in a different way with a longer term perspective has clearly grown. Walmart was one of the early of the, of the largest companies going back, I think, 11 years now to kind of their first really big goals and statements about sustainability. Um, but what I've heard repeatedly at meetings like this, at, at sustainability events for 15 plus years, and from clients and CEOs, is um, Wall Street doesn't care. I've heard that same phrase for many years, Wall Street never asks, right? So the CEO or the CFO or investor relations go and have their upwards of 200 meetings a year with investors, um, and they say they never ask. That seems to finally be changing. So there is something that's in the water or something that has evolved. Um, there's been a very clear movement in one part of the investment community, which is the institutional investors, led in large part by BlackRock. If you, if, for those of you not in the financial world, they're the largest asset owner in the world. They own 5 to 8% of basically every large company in the world. And from Vanguard, kind of second biggest asset owner. They've said some very important things over the last year, two, three, to the CEOs that they talk to regularly to say, you need to be thinking about the long term. And there's other long-term investors like Norwegian Sovereign Fund, CalPERS and CalSTRS. There's, there's been a category that cares. The, the kind of normal, when you think of Wall Street, the analyst community, those looking at companies, that's been incredibly lagging on, on this topic for a long time. But, but again, that has changed recently. And what started happening is the very big companies are getting questions now about ESG, environmental, social, and governance performance. So what we're going to talk about is um, whether those questions are the right ones, whether the investors um, who are now kind of new to this, this sustainable business discussion, are they, are they, um, are they helping or hurting? And I think it's probably both. So let me, let me start with you, Catherine, and, and um, ask you what, are you, uh, what are you hearing from the ESG community? What does that mean? Most big banks now have at least an analyst called an ESG analyst. What are they asking you, um, and do you think it relates well to um, the things you really need to be doing to, to drive sustainable performance? Um, <laughs> There's already he laughing. Said it. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I, um, so I have worked in environmental and social sustainability for 20 years, and I have waited for 20 years. My sort of in house language is for Wall Street to get woke. Um, and then they woke up. And I'm not talking about the folks who've been working and, you know, for many, many years trying with real um, precision and subject matter expertise on some of these issues, sort of the main uh, institutional investors. Um, and as they started to, to sort of, quote, unquote, get woke, 
I looked at, at how they were making decisions and what information they were using and how they were assessing Walmart, quite frankly. And, and I think, unfortunately, it, it, they're just missing some sort of fundamental pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say first and foremost, and I spoke about this yesterday, but when you, when you think about what our mission is, it is to save people money so they can live better. Um, and we feel very, very deeply that, that our whole business strategy, which is oriented around shared value, so doing work that delivers both a business benefit but also societal benefit, is really um, fundamental to, to our entire strategy. And we're focused on opportunities, so making Walmart a great place to work, sustainability, a lot of work on climate and sustainable products, uh, and then communities, so doing a lot of work on disaster and hunger relief. Um, and what I would say is that we have, um, when, we, when we hear from investors, they're still by and large asking us sort of our, our business growth strategy, our comp sales, sort of you know, your standard questions. Um, and then we'll have a separate call with the ESG folks, sometimes from that same bank, um, that are asking us very niche, very, in my view, odd questions that aren't really tied to our business strategy. And so, so I think just sort of fundamentally, at least the way we approach this work as a, as a shared value strategy for our business, I think investors, it, it's, it's the flip side of the same coin. If you're not understanding our sort of ESG strategy as part and part of our business strategy, you're not going to ask, you're not going to understand sort of the, the holistic view. Um, and so we, it tends to be this sort of weird, it's almost as if someone sort of Googled ESG issues <laughs> and whatever popped up in the last three months are the questions we get. And, and I'm happy to answer those questions, but you're missing our strategy. What are they, so what are they asking you? What, what kind of numbers are they looking for? Um, so, we, so what numbers are they looking well, what, what, for? What's what are the, the issues? You know, what are they asking you to report on? They're saying, hey, how much... How much so, fuel do you use? Yeah, right? so I'm sitting on a survey right now, um, which lets us know that we're a standard deviation uh, worse than our peers in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions we, we emit. We're Fortune 1, of course. <laughs> we're really, really big. I mean, we had... <laughs> asking us how much fuel we used has nothing to do with ESG. We own our fleet. Asking us how we perform from an intensity standpoint next to all of our other peers, whether or not they outsource or, or you know, however they own their own fleet, you know, that's a better under, way of sort of getting at, relative to our peers, how, quote unquote, good are we at efficiency and at, at using fuel. My, my argument on climate for what you should be asking companies if you're an investor that's sort of caring about these long-term things is, have you done a climate risk assessment? We have. Are you doing your part to reduce emissions in your own operations? We are. Are you working to pull emissions out of your supply chain, where if you're a CPG, most of your, most of your emissions quite candidly are? We are. Um, so, but we're getting, we're getting what, what is your cage-free egg policy? Like, we're getting weird <laughs> stuff. So. Yeah. Well, they're looking for risks, right? And, yeah. uh, and, and not so much strategy and upside. Yeah. So let's, so we don't, uh, we don't have anybody to beat on on this panel because we have one of the good investment houses that actually has been founded from the beginning on asking, I think, better questions or thinking differently. So Lala, can you just maybe quickly explain um, the philosophy of, of generation and, and what it does? I will, and, and actually the story of why generation exists and why we believe that we are may perhaps different, and we hope that more people are, are doing this, is that we don't separate out this capability of understanding you know, sustainability or ESG alongside financial performance. We just believe that these, are, these have to go hand in hand. And so the story around Generation is an investment firm. It was set up in 2004 in London and offices in San Francisco. And we have a shared view that the market is exceedingly short term and that if you take a long term investment horizon, um, it is just common sense that you integrate sustainability and ESG, both risks and opportunities. Um, so Generation today manages around $20 billion of assets on behalf of institutions. Most of that is in a public equities strategy. I used to work as a consumer analyst on the public equities team. Um, I joined the firm in 2004 and spent a, my early years in public and then have been doing private for the last decade. Um, but, but from the beginning, the, when Generation started hiring analysts, we required that each analyst was both financial and sustainability equipped. And that meant that if they were coming from a traditional sustainability background, that they had to get their CFA or be, have gone to business school or really get trained up on 
public equities analysis. If they were coming from a mainstream financial background, so one of our, our senior partner was formerly head of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, um, that these people who joined had to get their kind of CFA for sustainability going through a lot of conversations and in-house training as to what are the right questions if we get you on the phone. And candidly, I, not that I would disregard your role, but we want to hear it from the CEO. Yeah. So we want to talk to the CEO and the CFO about the handful the three to four material ESG factors that affect performance. And we want to go really deep on those topics. We want then to call Catherine and make sure that what she's focused on is consistent with what the CEO and CFO are talking about, and that we perhaps can call and talk to a board member and hear that they too understand that these are the critical factors that affect performance. That's the type of work that we spend a lot of our day hours doing. We will use public research. We'll engage with Carbon Disclosure Project. We were, were one of the um, early kind of supporters of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Boards, which tries to do this work on behalf of those who might not have the resources to do this, the training up, the focus of the material questions per sector. I think they've mapped you know, 80 industries now across 11 sectors of like, what are the critical questions that you should ask if you're lucky enough to get time with Catherine or one of her colleagues? So. Well, and there's and there's really good evidence now that the that this there's always been this false question in sustainable investing. Do, uh, do company do the investment houses or the or the funds that look for sustainable investments do better than not? Which I find a really strange question because if there was something that systematically always did better, every piece of every dollar in the world would go towards that. And it's like asking, do tech funds do better? Well, some do, some don't. Some are better run, some are not. So it's a very strange question. But the, the, the evidence is now very clear that the companies, um, there was a great study that some Harvard professors did that the companies that manage their most material issues, the really big things that drive or risk value for them in the sustainability agenda, those that manage those well do outperform, which makes total sense. They're well run. They're, they're, they're focused on the right issues. So there's this incredible short-term pressure. Um, if people saw recently, I mean, Wall Street punishes companies for doing something for the long term regularly. Twitter's stock just dropped um, a lot because their follower numbers dropped because they actually purged bots um, and hate-filled rhetoric, which is critical for their long term survival, right? It is the absolute right thing to do for that company, and their stock got pummeled, you know, 15 percent. One of the solutions that a few companies like Unilever has pursued is to change, try to change their investment you know, the, who their investors are, so they think longer term. Is that the right path? How do, you, how do you change what is kind of relentless pressure on your CEO, Doug McMillan, and, and every other CEO to pursue only three month or one month kind of projects? I mean, if I had the answer to that. Um, <laughs> I, you can share here. It's safe. We're in the safe zone. So. Um, no, I mean, I think to some degree we have to be able to provide assurance that we're going to be in business in three months and in six months before we can get to the longer term strategy. I mean, at the end of the day, if we can't promise that, then then it's sort of a moot point whether or not we're going to be around in 2030. Um, so I think you do have to address um, some of those immediate questions. And if you are unable fundamentally to do so, then you can't ever get to the long term conversation. So I, I think that's. That's part of it. We're a little bit unique in that we're 51% owned by the Walton family. And so we've got, uh, uh, I mean, it's the family. And so um, we've got a little bit more of um, an investor pool that really understands and appreciates sort of what our long-term strategy is and this whole orientation around shared value. Uh, but those near-term pressures are very real. Uh, we made a commitment a couple of years ago, uh, a, a significant uh, $2.7 billion investment in wages. Um, if, I don't remember the percentage because it was sort of a horrifying day where our stock just went straight down. Um, and, and so, and we, we've, we've brought it back up and, and there are a lot of reasons for how that played out in my view. But, but I think if you're paying attention to what we're trying to do with, with the sort of shared value side of opportunity, what we are really talking about um, is economic mobility and trying to figure out how we, and we've, there have been a lot of conversations about sort of the, the degree of education and qualifications and skills that people fundamentally have in the United States today and how those skill sets in many cases preclude advancement up, up a career ladder. And so we're Walmart, we ban the box. So if you know what that means, well, we don't ask about your felony conviction. So we've done a lot. To, so we don't require a college degree. We don't require a high school degree. We have done a lot to make 
retail an early um, opportunity for work with very low barriers. What we're really invested in right now is um, offering competitive wages, but more significantly, training. Because I think we're looking at the future with the rise of AI and, and the rise of automation and sort of understanding that the nature of work is fundamentally changing and our workers need to get sort of the skill set to perform these higher level, uh, sort of higher level order um, jobs. And the assumption is that as you move up the skill set, you'll get paid more. And, and so we're sort of really, really focused there. But everything you just described sounds to an analyst like additional cost, and right. thus we should sell. And so, right, right but that's, that's the business value side right. of the shared value side. So what we are seeing are trend lines of improvements in turnover, uh, a better in-store customer experience, um, all sorts of things you actually can start to quantify the sort of business benefit of all of these investments. So how do we, I mean, Lila, how do we increase the number of investors who understand that quantification of things that are hard to measure but are real value, right? This is, these so, are things that are hard to put numbers on but are, are significant. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that the Corporate, you know, the, the boardroom is where these discussions need to start and, and take place such that they have a debate around the material risks and opportunities. And then for, for those which are truly opportunities, so they're going to make these important investments over, that will play out over a long term, they need to provide metrics then to their external stakeholders, including the street, to say, here's how we will track this investment that we've made. So one of the you know, appalling statistics is from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, this is probably a decade ago, but I doubt it's changed that much, which says out of a survey 500 CFOs, 78% um, of them would forego a positive net present value investment if it meant that they would miss their next quarter earnings. So that is, that is actually bad economics. It's bad financial theory. It, it's poor decision making that comes all the way down from the top. Um, but it's certainly true, and I think to, to, to give, to bolster these commitments that are less financially tangible but could be result in lower turnover or higher retention, that you should provide a guidepost as to here's what we, we would anticipate seeing. And then over the long term, if you stretch the horizon long enough, that should deliver financial performance. And so I think that dialogue is really at the early, early innings. And if we take, take a step way back, Institutional investors have just, over the past you know, five to 10 years, made commitments to things like the principles for responsible investment, which says that they are now going to start pushing these questions into their managers. The managers are now kind of walking in the dark, talking to the different, you know, to public companies and to private companies with these questions. It's like, it's like everyone's learning a new language, and it's pretty imprecise, and it's a little messy. I'm encouraged by the flow, the fact that we have hundreds of billions and trillions with the intent to deploy capital with some consideration of sustainability factors. And I feel like what, what we all can do is try to drive up the level of sophistication and focus on materiality. I think that's really critical, such that we're mapping to what a business exists to do. And the businesses have to do a better job of saying, here's what we plan, here's how we're going to measure it as we go. Right. So in theory, the longer term, those institutional investors are thinking longer term, and, and again, BlackRock in particular, Larry Fink, the CEO, describing this year in his letter to, to the S&P 500 CEOs that how you define value creation has evolved. And he says, you know, it's got to be long term. It's all the things we talk about here. And, um, you know, some people went ballistic in the Wall Street Journal saying he doesn't care about returns, which is just ludicrous. Um, but what he's saying is what, what you define as success in a business or, or value creation is evolving. Have you seen the questions change for, I mean, the CEO goes out and says that. Have you seen the questions change when you sit down with a BlackRock or a Vanguard or institutional investor? I'm just investor? excited to get any sort of <laughs> sustainability <laughs> question. I'll, like, I'll take even a bad question. Um, you know, I, so my sense is, and, and I'm, I mean, I've worked in sustainability for 20 years, so I know good sustainability work when I see it. Um, but I don't always know sort of how Wall Street thinks about this universe. Um, my view is there are a lot of investors out there that are sort of values oriented. So I don't want to be in weapons, screen, fine, that, that's fine. Where we get most of the sort of ESG oriented questions, they're really tied primarily to risk. Mm -hmm. And I think they're not necessarily the best informed risk. Either they're not focusing on the things that truly represent sort of an order of magnitude larger risk. They're just, it's all, everything looks like risk. Um, and I think they're also getting their sources for risk information 
or their information on risk from sort of sources that I don't think are doing a very sophisticated job at pulling the nuance. I would cite a lot of the focus on controversy right mm -hmm. now as a proxy for ESG risk, and this is just to simplify it, anytime your name appears in the newspaper tied to a controversial issue, and I can tell you I work at Walmart, we're <laughs> in the newspaper <laughs> an I mean, awful lot, yeah. and some of that risk is, it, it's hard to sort of distinguish when that risk is, um, like we're, we're any riskier than our peers. And in other cases, we're in sort of higher risk chains where there are really environmental and social issues of concern and we share that risk with every sort of actor in the supply <coughs> chain. Um, I think the thing that, that the sort of large uh, institutional investors have not quite captured is this piece on value creation. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sort of the silver, the silver bullet, if you, were, if you will, where we start to think a little bit more nuanced about risk and value creation. Well, to say something that could be too harsh, I'm not sure that a lot of analysts actually know the models of what the yeah. models of value creation are. I mean, you're yeah. fundamentally drawing lines and yeah. asking if your quarter, you know, if your quarterly growth is going to look the same, and if it is, good, buy, yeah. if not, yeah. sell. I, I think mean, there's a lot of comfort in big data right, right now, and I've got access to Excel and a spreadsheet and can right. do a regression and. and it's yeah. meaningless. So um, we've just got. We, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we've just. Big data is good uh, if it's used right. Um, um, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lila. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Andrew.